Hey, before I jump in, uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at the book of Philippians chapter 4 in just a moment. But before I do, I just wanted to encourage each and every one of you. Uh, this week, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving. And next week, in a few short weeks, we're going to celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus. And we're going to celebrate here Christmas Eve with two services. I know you're so surprised. Like two services, we do them every Sunday. And so on Christmas Eve, we're going to be doing two services at 9 and 11. I would encourage you to participate. I would encourage you. I know the other day, Pastor Matt uh, created a, a Christmas Eve event on Facebook. Uh, so you can share that. You can invite your friends to that. You, if you haven't liked us on Facebook, please do so. Uh, but you can tag friends and be praying, hey, who can I invite? Who can I invite? It's going to be a special service. Uh, there's going to be photo booths. There's going to be, I believe, a hot chocolate bar, a cookie bar, because who doesn't want hot chocolate and cookies on Christmas? Uh, there's going to be some wonderful things. And we're going to have, I don't how many of you by show of hands have ever heard of Kenny G? You know who Kenny G is? Well, we're going to have Philly E and the RLC band here for Christmas, for, for Christmas Eve. And so I would say, make sure you get here early because they're gonna be the ones leading us into our countdown timer. So I will tell you this, you're gonna be blessed, all right? So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're here for that. Uh, and because of that, uh, we're gonna be doing what we call Deck the Halls on Tuesday from three to seven, uh, but we could use some help after service. So after service, we need to pull all of our Christmas stuff out that's behind that screen. And so if you can stick around for a couple of moments, that would be great and we appreciate your help. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Philippians chapter four. We're gonna grab there, be there in just a moment. But we are in our last week, week four of a series we've entitled Heart for the House. Just breaking down what are the values of Radiant Life Church? And so the first week we unpacked, we value love and people matter. People are always more important than projects and people are not projects. We value unity. We are better together. Our life groups tonight, better together. 15 homes gathering in Northeast Ohio, having some breakfast foods, right? Because we believe that we are better together and we can be vulnerable and share in those moments. And then last week we talked about how we value passion and going beyond. And what does it mean to, to not just go one mile, but how do we go two miles? And today we're going to be talking about the value of attitude. Because we value attitude, it means I can and I can. And so what does that mean in the practical sense? To say we value attitude, it means if we can, we will. If we, if we can raise money and feed 700 people a Thanksgiving meal, we will. Right? If we can, we will. Because we know that our attitude is often the lid of our effectiveness. It's the lid, it's the ceiling. It's the thing that keeps us from moving forward because we're, 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 we're finding defeat before we ever experience the battle in our minds. How do we, do the, how do we value attitude practically? It, it means we do what it takes and inspire others to do the same, right? We're willing to do whatever it takes. And then lastly, our positive attitude influences a positive reaction, right? Our positive mindset, our positive attitude, our outlook, has a positive reaction to others. Think about spread the gobble for a moment. So yesterday, almost 700 people were fed. Here's what I know is when you're serving, life is happening. You don't, and it's, hear me on this, it's, this was not an outreach event. This was an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so when you're out there serving and you're giving, what happens is your heart begins to fill up. Fill up with love and fill up with grace and fill up with mercy. And you're going, man, I didn't, know, I didn't know I could, I have this much joy in this moment. I thought I was coming to put a smile on somebody else's face and yet here I am. And so it's in that moment that, that our positive attitude influences a positive reaction. Did you know that daily you have 10,000 thoughts? Some of you are like, you don't know my mind. It's on over, <laughs> overdrive. Like I'll, I'll double your 10 and make it 20, right? You're like, I had 20,000, right? And what that means is we have about 3.5 million thoughts per year that run through our minds. And so what do we do with those thoughts? We're gonna read in a moment, the scripture tells us to take them captive. But what else does the scripture, this is why I love the Bible. If, you, if you're like the Bible, eh, it just seems like a boring old book. I would encourage you to begin to read it, unpack it. It is full of life, it's full of truth. It helps us. How do we value attitude? What does the scripture say about attitude? In Proverbs 23, seven, it says, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. How we think? That's who we become. Psalm 118, verse 24, it says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Some of you are like, I don't understand. What, what does, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. What does that have anything to do with our attitudes? Well, did you know he created other days other than Sunday when we come to church? 
which means he created Monday. Yes. And you're like, no, if you worked where I work, you would realize that was not created by him. That was the enemy. No, he created every day. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So every single day we can have a choice to rejoice and be glad in it, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of how we feel. And so that is, that is an attitude that we can have to choose him. Philippians 2, 5, this is a powerful verse. This is one I wrestle with constantly. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. The word must, I don't believe is describing the, the smell we get from our basement. The word must, doesn't that sound like it's a commandment? Doesn't that sound like it's something we should choose to do because Christ is saying, you must, this is a desire, our heart's desire should have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, eight through nine says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What that tells me is your thoughts matter. That negative thinking leads to negative living. So negative thinking leads to negative living. There were two friends, Sam and Joe, and uh, they were a little bit hard on their luck. They were a little bit down and out and they needed some funds. And, and so one day they, they see that their city council voted that there was an overpopulation of wolves and they were destroying families and yards and, and they were attacking dogs and things like that. And they said, okay, we need to do something. And so they said, hey, if you will, if you will, if you will help us take care of the wolf population, we will give you $5,000 in cash for every wolf that you bring to us. And so Sam and Joe are like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna become bounty hunters and we're gonna go out. And so they camp out in the woods and they're ready to go and they're prepared. And in the middle of the night, they get woken up from their sleep. 50, 50 wolves are outside their tents. They're, they're salivating, they're vicious, they're ready to attack. And Sam is like, this is it. My life is going to be over. That's one thought. And then his friend Joe was like, Sam, I'm not so, what, I'm not, I don't understand what you're so worried about. All I know is we're gonna be rich. And some of that, it, it comes down to our, what are, what are we thinking in the moment? What perspective are we seeing? I don't know about you, but I'm curious by a show of hands, how many of you have the spiritual gift of being defensive? <laughs> okay, that's not a spiritual gift. I'm just letting you know. I'm really just justifying my poor attitude sometimes, okay? But, but here's the deal. Why is it in our life, we, we're, it's so quick to go to negative? We're so quick when, when someone's speaking to be defensive. Why, why is it in our lives with our thought process that we go straight to self-pity? Like, I don't know about you, but it was 100% chance of rain on Friday and it rained for 100% of the day, 100% of the time. But, but sometimes our self-pity believes, no, it's just raining on me. It's a cloud that just follows me day and night. Everybody else, it's like being in, in Florida and it's 85 and sunny and it's like Disney World, it's just everywhere in their life. But my life is just rain and we go to self-pity and negative thinking or maybe we go to blaming. Right, our attitude takes us to blaming, as in, I feel a certain way, but I am not responsible for my own feelings. It must be because it's somebody else's fault. If they wouldn't have said that, if they wouldn't have woke up, woken up on the wrong side of bed, if only, and then we find ourselves blaming other people for our attitudes. Or maybe we go straight to anger or bitterness. You remember every miserable thing that's ever been done, the grudge that you hold. And some of you are like, no, I don't hold that grudge. And then you pull out your journal and you remember six years ago. You see somebody in the store, instead of having a conversation, you begin to walk the other way because you're stirred with your attitude and, and anger and bitterness have taken over. So how do we change our attitudes? Here's the first thing is we need to understand that we become what we consume. We become what we consume. You think through the music you listen to, the movies, the shows you watch, the conversations that you have at work, the people you date, the places you go, the things you do when no one's home, the TikToks you watch, the Snapchats you send, and we become what we consume. I remember years ago when Netflix uh, first came out and Angel and I are sitting down watching, we, we see this documentary, Super Size Me. We're like, oh, what's this about? And then we realized that a guy decided to eat McDonald's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and he became McDonald's, right? Because what we consume is who we become. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
And so we're, we're reeling in these attitudes and these thoughts and we're, we're lining it up and making it obedient to Christ. In order to do that, we've got to check our input. We've got to check our input. How many of you ever watched an, uh, an episode, any episode of The Chosen? Anybody watch parts of The Chosen? I'm curious. I'm assuming it's going to be rare, but at any point while you were watching The Chosen, did you have so much anger and bitterness in your heart that you wanted to choke somebody out? It's probably rare because the input of what you're watching, at least for me, it inspires gratitude. It inspires just an awe because I'm going, man, if, what, look what Jesus did. And it's continually reminding who he is and, and what his life was all about and, and the love that he had for me because the love that he poured out on his disciples as I'm a disciple, right? He's pouring that same love out on me. And so typically anger doesn't get the best of us because we're watching our input. I don't know about you, but after worship, how do you feel? I mean, so worship is over and, 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 and the team leaves. You may have walked in fuming. You may have walked in angry. You may have had all these emotions, but, but somehow, some way, because of the input that you have tapped into, you feel different. You go, man, I don't, oh, there, it was a release. There was a surrender. I think of the old, you know, you may have come in like fuming and you look like the old school movie Beetlejuice, right? You walk in and you, you, you're green and your head's spinning and you're like, I don't know what's happening. I'm just so frustrated. But by the end of worship, you, mo- you look more like Olivia, Right, have you ever seen my daughter wor- leave worship, man? She gets moving, right? And she's just jumping and she's feeling, maybe not recently, but soon, right? And so there's just some passion. And you're like, I don't know what's happening, but, but I walked in mad, but I'm leaving full of the Holy Spirit and full of joy. Why? We have to be willing to check our input. The second thing, how do we change our attitude is set your heart to make the change, right? Set your heart to make the change. Man, I think of Michael Jackson, right? Gonna, gonna make that change, gonna feel real good, right? Like you make that change, you set your mind to make that change. The first thing you look at is what am I putting into mind? The second thing is what needs to change? I've taken an inventory, I've reflected, and now I need to make some changes. Here's what I know, you cannot change the world that you live in, but you can change the way that you live in the world. Right, it's here, and it may not be changing, but you can decide to change, you can choose to change, you can have an attitude that's reflective of God's glory and his goodness. So what has your focus this morning? What has your attention? What's captivated your mind? Because whatever you magnify in your life, you will multiply. Whatever you magnify, you will multiply. A few short weeks ago, I was was vulnerable. I shared some of the things I was walking through and all the symptoms I had been having for months and how I was a doctor via Google and I, I figured out what was wrong with me and I went straight to worst case scenario because it was what I was magnifying. As I magnified, it multiplied. And so what are we magnifying in our lives? What what has your focus? Do you ever ever notice that you see things differently with a different perspective? Like if you go buy a black car, do you ever notice that everybody has a black car? Like I didn't know everybody had a black car until I got a black car, now everybody has a black car. You think about internet algorithms. Right, you're talking about something at home with your spouse and next thing you know, your Facebook, your social media, your internet, everything you go, there's ads now for everything you were just talking about. So this is what I'll do. I'll go grab Pastor Angel's phone and I'll be like, hey, Suri, Nike men's size, size 12 shoe. Then I'm like, hey, Suri, Browns tickets on sale, cheap. And then I put her phone down. Why? Because then when she gets on social media, she's like, I just feel led to buy a pair of men's shoes size 12. <laughs> Looks like my husband's going to the Browns game. I've been manipulated. No, no. Strategy. Pure strategic. Right? But, but here's the deal is, is what has our focus? And this is why it's so impor- imperative and important. We align our mind with the word of God. We have to be willing to mo- align our mind with the word of God. Think about the first 15 Take the first 15 minutes of every day, five minutes of worship, five minutes of prayer, five minutes of his word. What are we doing? We're aligning our thoughts to the word of God. And this isn't a mind over matter. This isn't just like positive thinking. This is walking in agreement with what the word of God says. Look what it says, Colossians 3, 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set our minds. That's what we need to do. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we have to be willing to renew our minds. 
So just as we've done the past few weeks, I wanna look at six behaviors of our attitude. So if we value attitude, I can, I can, what do the behaviors look like for that value? The first is this, because we value attitude, we're willing to celebrate others. We have to be willing to celebrate others. First Thessalonians 5, 11 says, therefore encourage one another and build each other up as just in fact you are doing, right? So we need to build each other up. We need to learn to rejoice and not reject those that are being blessed. Like rejoice with them, not reject them. We need to rejoice with those who rejoice. The real test of the kingdom heart isn't how we treat people when they're down, it's how we treat them when they're up. That's a kingdom heart. Right, it was a few short years ago, uh, my wife and I, we, we have some friends in the, the car industry, and uh, so one of our friends, Andy Howard, was working, uh, who comes to the church, was working at a Dodge dealership, and uh, we saw that they had this deal online, and I was like, this deal seems good, too good to be true. It's a brand new, fully loaded Dodge Ram, like the quad cab, and it, uh, you could come in and get one for, for a lease, and I was like, hey, we got to go talk to them, we got to see if this is the real deal. We knew the general manager at the time, and so we go in, and they're like, yeah, this is the real deal. You zero down, here's your payment, and we're like, Awesome. Our, our lease was up. We got rid of our previous lease. We got this one. It was too good to be true. And sometimes if it's too good to be true, it is. But th- for this, it wasn't. It was real. So we left the dealership. That week, we're driving around in this brand new Dodge Ram, right? Got the Hemi. I w- man, because it was a lease, I was just lighting the tires up, leaving the parking lot. Like, this, this was great. Um, it was all blacked out, like black, black rims, everything. I was like, whoa, 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 right. Within the first week, multiple people coming up must be nice. I was like, what? I mean, it must be nice. It must be nice to be able to have a brand new truck. And that's a $50,000 truck. How do you afford that on your salary? I'm like, well, first of all, don't judge me. Second of all, no. But here's the deal. What they didn't understand was I went in and said, this deal can't be true. And he's like, no, this deal is true. Here's what we do. We advertise it. The first five people who take us up on it get this deal. But what it does is it brings people to the dealership. And maybe they don't want to lease and maybe they want to buy. Zero down. One ninety nine a month. We had to pay taxes and title. We rolled that in. Our payment was $219 for two years on a $50,000 vehicle. So yes, must be nice. Favor ain't fair. That's what I had to say. No, but here's the deal. Like you look at that, why can't we just rejoice with those who are rejoicing? Why, why do we have to reject a blessing? Just because it isn't happening to us doesn't mean we can't receive it. So we need, we need to rejoice with those who rejoice. We need to speak to others to where, to where we want them, not where they're at, right? We need to inspire others. Here's, here's what I know is your words can be the catalyst to someone's calling. Your words can be the catalyst. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. So the words you speak, how you communicate to somebody, it can, it can truly be the catalyst to someone's calling. Number two, because we value attitude, we're willing to be resilient. Galatians 6, 9, it says, don't, don't become weary in doing good, but at a proper time, you will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I understand it's hard sometimes, right, to have the attitude and this mindset and be positive when we're living in this toxic society in this world, but don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing good. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves who we are, right? Put some notes on the mirror. You may get knocked down, but that means you have a choice to get back up. Right? You may have some defeat. There are people in your life who are going to let you down. And, my, and what I mean by people is everyone. We're all gonna miss the mark. But if we just give up on people every time they let us down, then, then really every relationship what we have will fail because we're all human. So sometimes we, we're like, oh, no, 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 I'm just never gonna talk to this person again. And I get, there are people that we should, there are people who are just way too toxic for us and, and they're hindering us and not helping us in our spiritual growth. I get that. But ultimately, are we getting back up when we get knocked down? Don't quit. Don't grow weary in doing good. Because we value attitude, we're willing to be thankful. First Thessalonians 5 says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstance, for this is God's will. And that's so hard to do, isn't it? Like rejoice always, give thanks in all circumstances. It's a lot easier to be thankful when I'm driving the Dodge Ram than not having a vehicle at all. Or we turned that in, I was like, no. And I was like, you got any more deals like that? And they're like, no, those deals long gone. But you pray and you give thanks in all 
circumstances. In just a few short days, we're going to gather with family and friends and loved ones. We're going we're to carve some turkeys. We're going to have mashed potatoes and sweet potatoes. It's a love language right there. We're going to have the dressing and the gravy. You can keep your green bean casserole, everything else you can bring my way. But we're going to have all this food. And then we're going we're gonna to have, we're, hopefully we're going to just take some time and reflect and, and be thankful. But I wonder, I just wonder, does that have to be something we do once a year? Can it just be the attitude and the disposition of our heart that we would want to gather around a table for meal and give thanks in all circumstances when we don't feel like it, when we do feel like it? that we'd be so thankful to God in the moment that we would count our blessings daily? What if we began to speak about how thankful we are? What if we began to think about how blessed we are? And what if we began to act on those blessings? I believe all of us need to develop an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude. I would encourage you today, like grab a piece of paper, grab your phone, begin to write out, I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for the the breath that I breathe. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that I have a house and some type of shelter over my head. I'm thankful that I have a meal to eat today. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my husband. I'm thankful for my children, even when they make a mess. Some of you know what I'm talking about with life groups tonight at your house. You're like, can you end up? Because I gotta get home, things to do. Can't let people see my house like this. (laughs) But are you thankful? I'm thankful for a job. I'm thankful for my paycheck. I'm thankful for, for lower gas prices. So come on somebody, right? I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for vacation. I'm thankful. And you begin to write a list and what you'll realize is there is so much more in your life that you can be thankful for. The, the, the list is gonna be much larger of thanks than it will be of regrets. So take some time and develop an attitude of gratitude. Because we value attitude, we have to be willing to be ambitious. Some of you are like, I'm not so sure how that, how that is a value, and why that's a behavior. First Timothy 2.15, it says this, be diligent, be ambitious, but be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. There's some diligence. Your attitude inspires you to continue to go after the good. Here's, here's, here's what I understand is the more, the more you serve, the more you love. The more you serve, the more that you love. And, and, and here we talk about it all the time. We're gonna talk, talk about it next week. It's our fourth Sunday. And we're gonna say the best way to serve God is by serving others. It's not something we say, it's something we believe. That we serve God with, with, with a love. And he, when we serve, we continue to grow in our faith. But hear me on this. We don't want you to join a team because we don't have enough volunteers. We want you to join a team because when you do, it gives you an opportunity to find your purpose. Each of us have a purpose. What is it, right? I say this quote all the time from Mark Twain. The two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Why are you here? The worship team has been given talents and gifts and abilities. They use those to honor God. They use those to serve him and serve his kingdom. Those working with kids, those out in the parking lot, every single area of ministry is an opportunity for us to fulfill our purpose. And so do we have that? Do we have the ambition to fulfill that purpose? I was a warehouse worker. I drove a tow motor. I was in charge of receiving, moving pallets in and out of trucks all day, every day, six, seven days a week sometimes. Thousands of pallets coming in and out and I know where they're at, where they're going and almost a 200,000 square foot warehouse. I was doing good. I had cheap insurance. I, I still remember the day when I was like, what's this that's coming out of my paycheck? They're like, well, that's for your medical insurance. And I was like, okay, but I don't need it. They're like, well, you may and other people do. And so the cost is, it's 25 bucks every other week. I was paying 50 bucks a month because I never used it. And I had dental and I had all of it. Never even, never even used it. I would love to have a $25 <laughs> every other paycheck, right? Medical insurance. But, but, but here's the deal. I was comfortable. And then I, then I went to another warehouse and I was, I was in charge. The owner was like, hey, just run this warehouse for me. I was like, okay, I got this. But in those moments, my wife and I began serving in student ministry. And we really enjoyed it. And, and then more responsibility came and then we started leading events. And I was like, there has to be more and maybe there's more. And so my wife and I really sought God in those, that season of our life. And here's what I found out. If you want his glory, then chase his presence. 
If you want his glory to be revealed in your life, if you want to experience his goodness, then you have to chase his presence. As I sought, as we called out together, here's, here's the thing that changed is I got a new assignment. And not only did I got a new assignment, I found my calling. And then I said yes to being a youth pastor, then associate pastor, and 12 years here being lead pastors. But our, sign, our calling has never changed, our assignment has but there was ambition, there was drive. It wasn't to go up the corporate ladder, it was to fulfill his purpose in my life. So do we have ambition to be able to seek his presence? Because we value attitude, we're willing to be accountable. To be accountable. I know you're like, that's a dirty word, I don't like that word. I, I don't, accountability screams, somebody else wants to be the boss of me. That's not what accountability screams. What accountability is, is a tool, a resource that will help shape your life. Here's what the word says in Matthew 12, 36. But I tell you that everyone will give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Wait a minute, I thought, I thought it would have been if I messed up, if I said a bad, if I did something bad. There's accountability for the empty words when I didn't encourage somebody, when I didn't build somebody up. Accountability is not, not there to hold us back. It's for us to find freedom. So uh, if you follow along on our um, spiritual growth plan, every year the church does a spiritual growth plan. Next year, it's gonna be really cool. We're changing things up. You're gonna love it, so make sure you sign up for it uh, in, the, in 2024. But this year it's on the Bible app, which we love, and we utilize it, and so there's this sweet app, and then you, you hit plans, and then you see the Bible in one year, and you go through it. Um, and I can't remember what day we're on, but we're doing good, people. Uh, but you'll see here there's a check mark, which means I completed it. If I click that day and I click that check mark, I can see everybody who signed up. I'll hide their names from you. And that check mark means they read that devotional too. Now, some of you would go, oh no, is pastor looking? Did I not follow along? I messed up. No, there's no judgment. That check mark for me is accountability. That's what that does for me. Not that I have to check off it because someone will be like, the pastor doesn't even read his Bible. You do know there's other, I'm just making sure everybody's aware that you can read your scripture outside of that plan, right? And so for me, yes, I do that. And yes, I love it. But that check mark is about accountability. It's inspirational to me. It's not demeaning. It doesn't mean, well, I have to. No, it's just a reminder that I get to, get to dive into the word of God daily and discuss it with each of you. And so that's accountability. Accountability in my life leads to responsibility for my life. That's what accountability does. Nowhere in the verse that I just read does it say that I get to blame others. I'm accountable for me. We have to own, own it. And lastly, because we value attitude, we're willing to be humble. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. This is so counterculture because our culture is like, no, listen, you, you do whatever you have to do to get to the top. It's a dog eat dog world. Like you, you wanna be in sales, you, you, need, you need to chew the person up next to you and spit them out. Like you, it doesn't matter. You do whatever you have to do. But the word is saying that we need to humble ourselves. See, pride closes the door to spiritual growth, but humility opens the door to transformational growth. One closes the door and says, no, I don't want it because I don't need any help. I can do it on my own. Can I just let you know this morning I've done that, I've walked that road, I have tried by myself and I failed over and over and over again. How many times I said I would never drink again to only drink again? Like I'm never, the hangover is so bad, I'll never, I will never. And two days later, hey, what are we doing tonight? And I couldn't find that victory because I couldn't do it by myself. And I'm so grateful that what we walk through in life, it doesn't have to be alone. We get to do it with Jesus, with humility. You see, the fruit of the Spirit grows in the soil of humility. You, you wanna be a person with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. You, you don't go to Antarctica, right, to plant fruit trees, because they won't grow. And it's hard for the fruit of the Spirit to come out in our life when, when sometimes our heart is a little chilled. So we gotta make sure the soil of our heart is right with humility. This past year, we walked 12 people through a leadership class. 32 weeks we met. We went through seven books on leadership. 32 videos or podcasts on leadership. 32 teachings on leadership. Assessments on leadership. What, 
the commonality of all those studies. You wanna be a great leader, you have to walk in humility. And where did we get that model first? Jesus humbled himself, left the throne room of heaven, came to earth, humbled himself, being a servant and giving his life on the cross. That's the model we see with humility. And so do we, do we walk in that type of humility? So as we close today, I just wanna share with you, are we willing to change our perspectives on our thought life? There was a conversation that was written about a dairy farmer. Dairy farmer was asked like, hey, what do you love about your job? What, what's the thing that just causes you issues? What's the struggle? And he said this, here's the problem with cows is they don't stay milked. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner have to go to the barn because they don't stay that way. And it's the same thing with our attitude. It doesn't just stay positive. There are struggles, there are trials, there are concerns, there are issues that we walked through. And so that means we have to choose to work at it on a daily basis. To say, man, I, I, if the scripture is telling me I need to have the same attitude as Jesus, am I willing to surrender to his will and take on that role of a servant and to have that same attitude? So that's my challenge for you today. Are you willing to have that kind of attitude? Just as I say every week, eyes closed, head bow, your head bowed, your eyes closed. This is a moment of reflection. This is a very personal moment. It's a very private moment. I don't want you looking around. I'm gonna have you look around in a minute, but for this moment, everything starts with Jesus. We can't have the attitude of someone we do not know. We can't be the same as if we don't have a relationship with. I can tell you this, that I fail. But as I got to know Jesus, I became more like Jesus. And the more I become like Jesus, the more that my attitude becomes more like Jesus. But it starts with a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus. So if you're watching online, one of our hosts would love to pray with you. If you're in the room, I'm just gonna take a moment to pray for you. If that's you and you need to give your life to Jesus, it starts today. Today is, this is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. If that's you, would you just slip a hand up with no one looking around and say, I wanna give my life to Jesus. I want today to be a fresh start. Thank you, thank you. I want today, I want today to be a fresh start. I wanna pray in just a moment. Before I do, you can, you can look up before I pray. If you're being honest this morning, and as we went through some of, the, some of these behaviors and we were looking at attitudes and we were talking about ambition and being thankful and, and being resilient and celebrating others and being humble, if there's an area that you go, ah, man, I need to work on that one. If you feel like there's an area you need to work on, would you be so bold and so vulnerable to just, would you just raise your hand? Say, I got some work to do. Let me be honest. I got some work to do. So here's what I wanna do with your hands lifted. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that, that we can surrender our lives to you. So Father, for the hands that went up, the hearts that are open to you, God, I, today, I pray today, today is, is, is a day of victory. Today is a day of salvation. Today is a day where we quit doing it on our own and we surrender to you. And God, I pray that hearts would be open to receive you. Those that said yes, Father, would you invade every cavity of their being? Lord, would you fill them full of your spirit? Lord, that today they would have a new, a, a, a newfound look on life because their life now is focused on you. And Father, for every hand that says, I need some help, I need some help with that attitude. Father, I pray today that we would walk in your spirit, we would have freedom in your spirit, victory in this battle, that our attitude would be more reflective of you and less reflective of our feelings. Father, may we give thanks in all circumstances for your goodness, for your love that you have lavished on us as your children. So Father, thank you for loving us today. In Jesus' name, amen.